can heat it up. Ready to go? I think we're ready. Seven o'clock. Let me get to a uh, agenda here. I just had it. What did I do with it? Did you, you steal agenda? mine? Yeah, agenda thing. Oh, this? Oh, yeah. I thought I had one. Oh, this will work for now. <laughs> we'll go ahead and call the uh, SK to Planning Commission meeting to order at 7 o'clock here on the 15th of September. We do a roll call. Uh, yeah, uh, Commissioner Hartley. Here. Commissioner Perkins. Not here. Not yet. Commissioner Enos. Yes. Not here. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Sager. Here. Commissioner Hawks. Here. Commissioner Brittle. Here. And Chairman Wheeler. Here. Looks like we have enough to have a Forum here. So we will go ahead and move on to the approval of the August 25th, 2022 meeting minutes. I believe I was the only one absent at that meeting. It is. Oh, yes, I will eventually. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Glad you're prepared. <laughs> we we'll need a motion and a second on this. I'll make the motion. Second. We got motion and a second. Any discussion needed on this? All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Yep. Motion secure. All right. Approval of those minutes uh, passes. Uh, next up, we have public hearings. Uh, looks like we got three of them here. Well, two items and uh, questions and answer with the city manager, but we'll start with 2022-05-Annex, uh, 30203 Southeast Eagle Creek Road. And with that, we'll hand it over to the planning staff. Thank you. I will share my screen or PowerPoint here. For those of you that are new to the uh, process here, what we'll do is we'll have him do a staff report or, or them collectively, now that we have more than one person doing it. Um, and then we will open uh, a portion of the meeting to public comment. Uh, and then we close it back down and we do our decision making as a planning commission. And then uh, just so you can, you'll have opportunity to speak if you'd like. So that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Good evening, commissioners and members of the public. Uh, first off, staff will present its report on 2022-05 Annex, also known as 30203 Southeast Eagle Creek Road project. Um, so tonight, Planning Commission will forward a recommendation to Council, who will issue a decision at their meeting on Monday, September 26th. And that decision is final unless it is appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals or LUBA. Uh, if the proposal is approved, Council will then put the annexation into effect by adopting a resolution to annex the property into city limits, but only after all conditions of approval have been met. And I will go over those in just a bit. So let's see. Okay, so this is the applicant and property info. Uh, we have applicants William Jardine, who is present. Um, and the property, as you can see, is it's um, just south of River Mill Road and west of Southeast Eagle Creek Road and east of Highway 224, just nestled right in there. And so the comp plan map shows that the property is entirely within the urban growth boundary. Um, this satisfies the first requirement for annexation. Um, the vicinity map with incorporated areas shaded tan, or I guess they're kind of gray, there, um, it shows that the property is adjacent to existing city limits on its northern, or no, I guess on its southern boundary. This satisfies the second requirement for annexation. In section 
0.030 lists the approval criteria that need to be met in order for the council to approve annexation. And so part A is the proposed use for the site complies with the Estacada Comprehensive Plan and with the designation on the Estacada Comprehensive Plan map. B, that adequate capacity of urban services exists or can be made available within three years of the annexation approval. And C, the findings documenting the availability of police, fire, parks, and school facilities and services shall be made to allow for conclusionary findings either for or against the proposed annexation. The adequacy of these services shall be considered in relation to annexation proposals. And now I'll go each over each of those criteria in turn. So for A, the first, the first criteria regards the compliance with the comprehensive plan. Um, since the applicant is proposing to zone the property according to its designations, um, the adopted designations, um, which are highway commercial and commercial mixed use, this criterion is met. For the second criterion, um, this one pertains to the availability of city services, which includes sewer, water, and um, street network. The applicant submitted a capacity statement from the city engineer, which was dated June 13th of this year. And that documented that the city can indeed serve this property, provided that it develops according to the uses and densities allowed in the proposed highway commercial and commercial mixed use zones. And last approval criterion requires findings regarding the availability of police, fire protection services, parks, and school facilities. And the city contracts with, uh, with Clackamas County Sheriff's Office for police services and the properties within Estacada School District and the Rural Fire, Fire District. And both of those districts received notice of this annexation proposal and neither submitted concerns. Um, and as for parks, Wade Creek Park and the planned Campanella Park are both about a half mile away. And Timber Park is about a mile in the car from the house on the property. And so all these findings satisfy criterion C. Okay, so that's really small text, but I will read, I'll read a lot of this for you. Uh, the recommended approval includes the following conditions, uh, that the annexation includes the 5.3 area as officially described in the county's tax map, that the applicant sign a waiver of remonstrance against the dedication of right-of-way and other transportation improvements that the city may require in the future, as well as provide revisions to the illustration and legal description of the property to the Department of Revenue in order to complete the taxing district boundary change, that the property be zoned as designated in the city's comprehensive plan map, on council's rec adoption of the annexation. And finally, that the city's cop plan map and zoning map be amended to reflect the annexation and zone changes. And that pretty much concludes staff's report on this proposal. Um, but before we hear comments from the applicant and any public testimony, testimony, are there any questions that planning commission would like to ask? Any questions at this time? I have a question. Um, just out of curiosity, what prompted the request for annexation? Um, that's a question for the applicant. Yes. Okay. Uh, can, will you? Uh, sorry. Can we wait, and when we get them out there, you want to ask them directly? Okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, we'll open that up here in just a second. Um, Tara, are you still on there, and do you have any questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I am actually curious just, um, you know, cause we get the thing about the, the sewage treatment plant um, every time, you know, like how, whether, how long that's gonna be um, workable for and whether it's workable given the, the um, current proposal. And I'm just curious, does that information about, um, you know, wh whether this, whether this capacity is sufficient, does it take into account all of the stuff? Is it like a running tally of all the stuff we've already approved and all the stuff that's in the works now, or is it just based on where we're currently at each time? Yeah, it is a running tally 
uh, they take into account every, every time there's a land use application that requires a capacity statement um, or an actual development, you know, subdivisions, for example, don't require a capacity statement, but the city engineer gets notified and is very involved in those processes. So um, they take all of those things into account even before the subdivision is built. Um, they've calculated how much capacity to expect to be taken up by those approved developments. Um, I think that answered your question. Yeah, totally, thanks. Okay, and then I will also just add, since it's kind of on topic, um, the, the pre-app meetings and, um, yeah, I guess just pre-app meetings that we have with the city engineer for annexations, that's the time at which we ask for that first indication um, from him or their office of um, where we're at in our capacity. And then when they actually come in with the annexation application, is you know they re-review that um, or need to have a relatively updated letter from the city engineer. Um, and in the past, I don't know, four to six months, um, we've had a couple conversations with Kurt, the city engineer, about um, how we are approaching capacity, which he um, indicates in those letters. Um, but he's been able to confidently continue issuing these capacity statements because we are on track to build the new sewer treatment facility. That said, the closer we get to the time at which that construction needs to begin, um, the, the less confident uh, he'll be in issuing those statements. And so um, trying to be on the extra careful side of that, um, we have between planning staff and the city engineer agreed to um, advise potential annexation applicants that um, the city is less likely to uh, approve annexation applications um, until that actual construction of the facility has begun. And so there, the last pre-op that we had for an annexation where Kurt was able to confidently um, confirm capacity was an annexation that was just submitted. Um, that'll come to you in the, in the next couple of months. Um, and so after that annexation, so basically I'm saying there's only gonna be one more annexation after which um, staff will be providing you guys a basis for denial. Um, you know, on the basis of capacity concerns, um, and we'll be advising potential annexation applicants that maybe they should wait <laughs> until that new facility is built. So, just for your information, and hopefully okay, that I'll mm -hmm. I'll stop there. Go ahead. Is there a timeline for the construction of that treatment plant? There is, and I'm not the best person to ask about it. Sorry. But we we can, well, Kurt, the city engineer, is the best person to ask for that. And so he's um, been on vacation for a week or two. But um, we can either provide an updated, like get an updated overall capacity um, report or statement for maybe the last quarter of this year, or um, Melanie might be able to provide an update about that at our conversation later tonight, too. So. Okay, uh, any other questions at this point in time? Okay, so with that, um, thank you for the staff report. We'll go ahead and uh, open the public testimony on this. So I'm gonna read a statement here and then I'll invite those of you that wanna come up and speak about it uh, to come to the mic. Um, an issue which may, the basis, which may be the basis for an appeal to the city council must be raised prior to the close of the uh, at the final evidentiary hearing on the specific application. Such issues shall be raised with sufficient specificity as to afford the city council and the parties uh, an adequate opportunity to respond to each issue. Failure of an issue to be raised at hearing in person or by letter or failure to provide sufficient specificity to afford the city council and parties an adequate opportunity to respond to the issues precludes an appeal to the city council. So with that, would the applicant or somebody representing the applicant like to come to the mic and 
give us a rundown on this? I know there's one question here on just the, the timing of it and what's prompted you to throw your hat in the ring at this point in time. And if you could introduce yourself and uh, provide your address too, that'd be great. Is there a green light? No, no light. Always oh, move the podium a little bit. Too. <laughs> All right, yeah, there we go. William Jardine, three zero two zero three Southeast Eagle Creek Road. And I don't really have anything to say. So, uh, Didi had asked. Uh, you can go ahead and ask your question directly to him. I'm I'm just curious what prompted you to annex want to annex into the city limits? It qualifies for being annexed. I wanted to do it while I could in the, in the property in-house art for sale. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for him while he's up there at the mic? Mm -hmm. Terry, you got any questions on the Zoom link? Nope. Okay. Well, thanks for coming up. Be ready. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> If anybody else would like to come up and speak uh, in favor of the application, feel free to come on up. If you want to speak in opposition of it, come on up. If there's nobody else to speak, we'll just go ahead and close down the uh, public hearing portion of this and re-enter into the uh, planning commission meeting at 717 here. And it doesn't look like anybody's jumping on it, so let's go ahead and do that. So we'll go ahead and enter back into the planning commission meeting. Uh, if we could get the options up there, the approved with conditions, uh, approve with more conditions and then denial. Um, that's always helpful. So there's where we're at, ladies and gentlemen. We need a motion and a second, and then we can discuss. I move to approve with the conditions presented. I second. So we got a motion, we got a second. Uh, is there any need for further discussion? We'll bring forward. Okay, I guess we're at that point. So all those in favor, please raise your right hand. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. <laughs> so that's approved unanimously. This will get forwarded on to the city council now. Uh, I believe. Uh, September 26th, they will hear this application. Okay, September 26th. Uh, if there's any issues with it, uh, raise those directly with the planning staff here at city hall but i assume since we have an approval there shouldn't be any issues at least at this point in time so thank you for coming today and we're going to move on to item b which is uh 2022-02-lp uh 199 northwest 6th avenue and this is a two lot partition of a just under half acre property uh -oh. host has disabled can you make me a co-host uh, while we're working on that, uh, this property address is uh, 199 Northwest 6th Avenue. Um, looks like a request for conditional use and permit a construction of a, another duplex. So once Taylor gets this up and going, we'll dive into this head first. Okay, thanks for your patience. Um, all right, good evening, commissioners. This is 2022-02-LP. It is both a partition and a conditional use request. And the planning commission's tonight, uh, decision tonight will be final unless it is appealed to the city council. The applicant is Michael Kerr. Do I pronounce that correctly? Okay, um, and the property in question is 199 Northwest 6, as Ben just said. The tax lot number is 34E 
20 AD 1400. Um, so we're looking at a 0.45 acre rectangular lot um, on the north side of Northwest 6th Avenue. It has an existing single family home. Uh, Wade Creek runs along the south edge of the property. There are not any other um, potentially sensitive habitats or hazards that we're aware of, and there is virtually no slope. Here we're looking at a zoomed in look at the um, comprehensive plan showing the property zoning designation. Um, the property is shown in that light yellow, which the legend tells us is in the R-1 low density residential zone. And the applicant is not proposing any zone change. So the proposal includes a two lot partition creating one 7,700 square foot lot and one um, 11,900 square foot parcel lot. I use those interchangeably. Um, they're not proposing any zone change. Like I said, they're just requesting to split the lot and build duplexes, one duplex on each lot. Currently duplexes are um, a conditional use in this zone requiring planning commission approval. The request also includes um, allowing them to build that first duplex before the existing home is demolished. Usually you would not be allowed to build a duplex on a lot that also has a single family home. So to build that duplex um, before the new lot lines, oh yeah. So uh, they are asking to build the duplex first, then demolish the existing single family home. And they wanna build the duplex before the new lot lines are recorded. I hope I didn't make that confusing. I can answer questions on that if I did. Um, so once the new lot lines are recorded, then it won't matter whether the single family home has been demolished or not, because they'll be on different lots. Um, but the applicant, I think, wants to begin building sooner than later. We can ask him about that today. Um, and so it'll take time for them to meet all of the conditions of approval that are required before platting the new lot lines. Um, so yeah, to prevent delays in the building, um, they're requesting this you know, specific permission to begin building that duplex. Okay, for that reason, we added an 18th condition of approval um, that is not shown in the published staff report, but we realized needed to be included in there. Um, and that 18th condition says, or would say if you agree to include it, prior to final plot approval, the applicant shall either apply for and complete, demolish the existing single family home, or they can agree in writing to waive the conditional use approval to build a duplex there. So this is just to make sure that um, they're promising to remove the single family home. Um, they either follow through with that promise or they don't have the conditional use approval to build a duplex on that lot in addition to the single family home. Um, here's their proposed site plan. <laughs> I also want to note here that the it's almost 12,000 square foot parcel is proposed to be a flag lot. So we have the flagpole on the east side of the property, north is to the left on this picture. Um, our code does not allow the flagpole part or the staff part of a flag lot to be used in the calculation of lot size. Um, so the applicant is gonna need to resubmit a site plan or a preliminary plat that shows the lot size calculation, excluding that flagpole portion. And so the lot size is gonna to need to be um, at least 7,500 square feet, which is the minimum required lot size for any lot in the R1 zone. Um, that is also the minimum lot size that's currently being proposed for duplexes um, with the pending ordinance that uh, contains those housing amendments. Um, however, that is still pending. So currently a duplex would require a, um, an 8,000 square foot lot. 
Um, so just in case those amendments don't get adopted to include the 7,500 square foot lot size for duplexes, um, this condi conditional use approval will need to clarify whether the Planning Commission is permitting the development of duplexes on the proposed lot sizes. So will this conditional use permission allow a duplex to be built on a lot that's 7,700 square feet and on a lot that um, we don't have the total calculation up here because it wasn't provided, but um, yeah, we will we'll need clarification on that from you. Um, okay, so the staff report is split up into six part, parts. Part one is just background and basic information about the proposal. Parts two through five shown up on the screen review the different chapters of the code that contain the approval criteria. And part six contains the recommendation and conditions of approval. So the planning commission's job tonight is to determine whether the proposal meets the approval criteria in these chapters. And planning staff um, has provided our review in the staff report. So the planning commission can either agree or disagree with staff's interpretation of the code. And then if there are some approval criteria that you don't think are satisfied with the proposal, that's when you would either add or change the conditions of approval or deny the application if the problem could not be resolved by adding conditions of approval. Um, so next we're gonna walk through each of these code chapters and consider how the proposal meets or could meet the criteria there. So chapter 16.16 is the low density residential zone. You can find review of this chapter in part two of the staff report. And this zone establishes that duplexes can currently only be permitted as conditional uses. It also establishes the development standards for this zone, which is where we see the minimum lot size requirement for a duplex usually being 8,000 square feet. Um, but this request would permit a smaller lot size, 7,700 square feet, um, and that larger flag lot. But like I said, the calculation should not include the flagpole. Um, unless the Planning Commission decides tonight that both of the lots need to be at least 8,000 square feet to have a duplex on them. The other thing this zone established is that, um, well, it just references the off-street parking requirements, which for a duplex, it will require two spaces per unit. So each duplex would need a total of four spaces since there's two units in each. Um, that's a total across the two duplexes, that's a total of um, eight off-street parking spaces. And then um, curbs and sidewalks either need to be installed or um, bonded for or otherwise guaranteed before they'll be able to pull any building permits and before they'll be able to plat the new lot lines. Chapter 16.88 uh, establishes conditional use requirements, five requirements for a conditional use to be approved. So um, the first one, obviously it has to be listed as a conditional use in the underlying zone. And this is true, duplexes are conditional in the R1 zone. Next, the characteristics of the site are, must be suitable um, for the proposed use, considering the size, shape, location, topography, existence of improvements, and natural features. Um, so for size and shape, the property is a 0.45 acre rectangular lot with very little slope. We don't have any indication that the size or shape um, would conflict with the proposed duplexes if it's approved. The total lot size is over 19,000 square feet, which is certainly large enough for um, that many units um, to be built meeting the setbacks and other standards of the underlying zone. Um, for location, the properties in the R1 zone, it's on the north side of Sixth Avenue across from properties on the south side that are zoned for residential commercial uses. Um, there's uh, no indication that duplexes would be in conflict with those uses. Um, Topo top topographically, uh, the property is basically flat. The Dogami Bulletin hazards map doesn't show any hazards or high shrink swell soils, and the area is not in any mapped floodplain. Oops, 
um, improvements. The lot does lack sidewalks, which, like I said, um, will need to be installed before platting or building permits or otherwise guaranteed. Um, and the partition is also going to require half street improvements to ensure that there's an 18 foot width of pavement from the center line of sixth to the curb um, with a minimum four and a half foot curb tight sidewalk per the city engineer's requirements. And then lastly, natural features. Um, there's Wade Creek running along the south end of the property. The city has a storm drainage master plan, which does um, call for stabilizing those creek banks. So they're gonna need to do that and install a new box culvert. Um, the city engineer and public works will oversee and permit that work. And then there's also um, an SDC credit that will be available for a portion of the cost of those storm improvements. Um, the site, the next uh, criteria is that the site and proposed development needs to be timely considering the adequacy of the transportation system, public facilities and services. So the city's TSP, Transportation System Plan, classifies Northwest 6th Avenue as a major collector, which can accommodate the potential relatively small increase in traffic. Um, the public utilities have capacity to serve the proposed um, development. There's an eight inch water line existing in Northwest 6th Avenue that can serve the site. They will have to um, bring sewer to the lot. Um, it's available in either Wade Street or eighth, at 8th and Broadway, but it's not adjacent to the site. So they're going to have to do um, an off-site sanitary sewer extension. That can be reimbursed. They can have a reimbursement agreement um, for any adjacent properties that hook up to that new line within the next 20 years. Um, and then Per usual, each new lot will need to have separate utilities. The next criteria is that the use should not alter the character of the surrounding area in a manner which substantially limits, impairs, or precludes the use of surrounding properties for the primary uses listed in the underlying district. Um, so looking at the area within about a quarter mile of this property, we have single family homes, multifamily dwellings, city parks, schools, churches, and light commercial uses. Um, so the proposal to develop duplexes on two lots that are um, larger than the minimum required lot size in the R1 zone um, and larger than what is likely to be soon the minimum required lot size. Although if, that, if those amendments don't go through, then we have that question about the 8,000 square foot lot. Um, meeting all other development standards of the underlying zone. Um, we don't anticipate that creating any substantially more traffic or other nuances um, that would disrupt those neighboring uses. And then last uh, criteria in this chapter is that it needs to satisfy or at least not conflict with um, whatever comprehensive plan goals or policies relate to the proposal. Um, and so this is where there's um, discretion and interpretation, um, you know, interpreta interpreting our comprehensive plan goals and policies. Um, the staff report goes into detail about how several of these comp plan goals or chapters um, do apply tan at least tangentially to the proposal. proposal. Um, but the primarily relevant one is bolded on the screen here. It's the housing goal, which is chapter eight. Um, that chapter finds a deficit of non-single family home, uh, non-single family housing types. So um, this proposal would be creating six new, what, what are called middle housing units, um, non-single family housing units. Um, or the, the proposal at least could result in six new units because we have the four proposed units across the two duplexes. And then if the applicant wants to develop one accessory dwelling unit per lot, that would be allowed outright in the um, R1 zone. 
So the next part of the staff report is part four. Um, this part uh, and chapter 16.116 establishes the design standards that all land divisions need to comply with. So any subdivision or partition. And the staff report, once again, gives um, more detailed responses that I'm gonna show than what I'm showing on the screen. Um, but I'm, I'm just summarizing them here and reiterating that um, the conditions of approval capture these requirements, um, including the existing driveway uh, will need to be expanded to at least 12 feet wide per the um, fire district and city engineer requirements. Um, a, a reciprocal access um, easement is gonna need to be provided and shown on the plat um, for that shared driveway. Frontage improvements are gonna be need to, need to be built to city standards. So we have curb, four and a half foot sidewalk and that 18 foot half street pavement. The flag lot must have at least 25 feet of frontage on um, Northwest 6th Avenue, which the plan does indeed show. They're gonna need to provide a 10 foot public utility easement across the frontage of the lot, both lots. Um, sewer and water, separate sewer and water um, services will need to be provided to each lot. They're gonna need to stabilize the creek banks and insp install the new box culvert. Um, utilities will need to be undergrounded unless they meet the criteria for exemption for that, which are provided in the code. Um, and I can provide that information if, if you think you might be exempt. Um, and then lastly, this approval will be valid for four years. So if they don't come in um, and plat those new lot lines within four years, then the approval um, becomes invalid. Um, and at that point in time, if the single family home has not been demolished, then the city would have grounds to impose a lien or you know, take other actions that I, I hope we don't run into that. Part five of the staff report looks at the criteria that are specific to partitions. Um, most of these are procedural or are you know, reiterated in other sections of the code. For example, item E down here, all partitions shall comply with this other section of the code. Um, so I won't go into much detail either, but I just wanted to confirm that the procedure for partitioning has been followed. All of these criteria have been found to be met. The code does lay out in detail the steps of that procedure for us, um, which is what guides staff's process here. Um, and then finally, part six of the report is the recommended conditions of approval. I won't read through all of these, but um, we do have them all on screen in case any of them need to be discussed. Um, and so yeah, the approval would only permit a two lot partition. The layout would be substantially so similar to what they submitted and, and what if the planning commission approves that, unless you want to require the lots to both be at least 8,000 square feet. We can talk through the details if so, and then um, and include that condition if so. And the conditions also um, make sure that all of the public improvements and engineering requirements will be met before they're allowed to plat the new lot lines. Some of those requirements, such as sidewalks and utilities, will have to be done before they can even pull building permits. They are gonna to have to widen the existing driveway, like I said, to meet the fire district and city engineer standards. They are gonna to need to record the reciprocal access easement. They'll need to underground all utilities unless they qualify for the exemption in 16.116.010 item S. This page has more standard requirements. And then here are two additional conditions, number 18, was added to make sure that the existing home is either demolished or if they do want to keep it, that would be fine, but they wouldn't be allowed to build a duplex on that property. And then the last condi condition is that option to require the minimum 8,000 square foot lot size if the upcoming amendments don't reduce it to 7,500 square feet for duplexes. 
So now I'll take questions from the Planning Commission, and then I think we can hear from the applicant after that. Go ahead, Richard. I got a handful myself. <laughs> so going back to the beginning, talk of, of releasing a building permit to build a duplex prior to the partition. Prior to the partition and prior to the demolition of the existing single family home. So all that stuff you just said in the report indicated the half street improvements, sewer line improvements, figuring out where the sewer is, um, stream crossing, uh, sorry, the, uh, the creek needs to be reinforced, all has to take place prior to this. Prior to, um, pr you mean prior to building the new duplex? No, the, um, the creek stabilization would, they probably would want to do it all. I don't know. Um, the driveway will need to be widened. Mm -hmm. The sidewalk will either need to be installed or they can bond for it. Um, and the curb. The half street pavement is a condition specific to the partition. So, so I don't know why they wouldn't do that all at the same time, but for our purposes, we can't issue a building permit unless um, they have built the sidewalks, they're proposing to build the sidewalks concurrent with the built construction, or they're somehow guaranteeing it like bonding for it, um, or have a deferred delayed site improvement or something like that. Um, or have a variance. So, um, so I, I guess my what my first train of thought is like, this isn't an easy one. Like what I would term as an easy one of just going in there and yeah, we're going to divide this. Everything's already existing, sewer line, everything to the lot. It's far from that. So like, why? I understand that there's a lot of work to do, but there's no way you're going to get a final building permit until you have a sewer line run to the house or power or water or access. So like, why are we putting the cart before the horse and even looking at this and that nature rather than just saying, you need to get all this stuff done and then you can get your building permit. And is that something that we have to decide or is that something the planning can say, here's the process, just follow the process because you're not going to get past go until you do all of these things. We certainly prefer just following the normal process <laughs> as staff, but the planning commission can decide to permit that duplex development. I mean, you can put that in the conditions of approval or um, clarify that as part of your approval. Okay. That's up to, that's our question for, for you all. Okay. One of our questions. Um, the other thing you had mentioned where they had to go fetch the sewer from, what was that location? Either <laughs> over at Wade Street or um, in at 8th and Broadway. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, have you come up here in just a minute, if that's all right. Are you coming down 8th? That would be up by Broadway. Broadway School. So you're going to go around that corner and then go back up that road? I don't know yeah, if it Broadway. goes down, I, I would, I don't know if it goes down 8th or if it goes down Broadway or both, but the public works director said that the nearest, the two nearest places that they would extend it from are either 8th and Broadway or Wade Street before it turns down sixth. Okay. Okay. That's I thought I heard eighth and I was trying to find it on the proximity map. And that's yeah. well, it's 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 up by River Mill School yeah, right next in that year. area. My brother did too. Okay, along the apartments there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And then as far as when you were talking through the staff report, just quick square footages, two 8,000 square foot lots shouldn't be a problem because even as it's drawn up right now, the, the flag stem makes the back lot 8,200 and change and the front lot would be the bulk of that. So that, that question's already at least somewhat answered in my mind. But I'm sure there's more. Richard, go ahead. Well, you just almost touched on all of it. Uh, 
You said there are 25 foot roads this way from uh, the street on frontage would be the full length of the lot then for the half street improvements for sidewalks, curbs, and asphalt, I take it. On sixth, yes. On sixth. Yeah. Okay. Then you came back, you got 25 foot for for ingress, egress, whatever it is. And not one of us has talked about you're going to need a 24, 25 foot bridge then. Right. And, uh, and that's the box culvert you mentioned, right? The box culvert, yeah. But I I don't think that it needs to be the minimum width that I got from the city engineer and fire district was 12 feet. This is one of those type of cases that uh, that was hit me that we all jumped over the bridge without identifying. So we all know how much water will run down that creek. Mm -hmm. We've seen it a couple of times in our life. Yes. But um, let's see. Bridge itself, I guess those standards are going to come up because you can't have 12 feet for your two cars. In and out. That might be just what the fire department needs to get in. Still, but yeah. So, anyway, my other my other thought was, if you're going to put a, I don't know if they're going to do this, put a third ADU on the spot, that would that would be a total of twelve parking lots and parking spaces somewhere on the property. If I add that up right. Only the duplexes require off-street parking. Accessory dwelling units can, well, I don't know, but the city, the city can't, the city definitely cannot require an additional off-street parking for an accessory dwelling unit if the primary dwelling units spaces are required or are provided. So if the duplexes have their minimum four spaces per unit, then the city could not, the state will not allow the city to require additional parking spots for the ADUs. So. So just to be clear, a duplex <coughs> on a normal lot would require two spots per plex. So four spots total. Mm -hmm. So So eight spots would be the requirement between these two lots. Yes. And no additional if ADUs are required. Right. If that minimum was met. Right. Okay. Perfect. Richard, yeah. what's next? I guess I heard what you said. Let's see. There's four doors and eight spots. Right. Four front doors and eight spots. But I'm not saying if you're going to add a, an extra ADU on one of them. Possible. Um, you're not going to have any off-street or on-street parking. Right? We'll ask him. <laughs> so, you know, I, I realized a lot. I, it was my teacher's mom. Uh, way back in first grade. So, mowed it off. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, did, we did that. We did that. And I'm sure we can get the fire department and the engineer to jointly comment on that if, if it's not clear. It's... Yeah, and there is a condition of approval. Let me see if I can find it here. There is a condition of approval requiring both the fire district and the city engineer to sign off on, and the public works director, to sign off on um, those final plans, specifically the shared driveway. Um, let me find it. Oh, 
but I guess my, my question is we've not ran into this particular rebuild the bridge or we'll throw water uh, for living and development. I don't recall it. I, I don't either. And on a, yeah. They're all single family dwellings on that old trip. trip. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, we can we can mold that and see if we can dig for it in the time. Sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, the engineer he did say he required the twelve feet for the access easement for the first parcel, and then he said a reciprocal access easement needs to be provided over the entire twenty five foot flag if the driveway is intended for joint use of both lots. So it would need to be double. So the e right. What I heard you say is that the bridge needed to be 25 feet wide, 24 feet wide. The easement needs to be 25 feet wide. Right. Of bridge or easement. Bridge. Right. So there's, so I think we're saying different things though. The easement is just the legal, you're allowed to be on my private property. The, you're, you're saying that they need to construct a 24 foot wide bridge and paved driveway width. <laughs> well, it needs to be paved, the city requires it, will require it to be paved. Um, so the entire flag will be, flagpole will be paved. Yes. I know we have development up there, you had part of some of that. Sorrow? Like, uh, narrow roof thing. Yep. And uh, that had to be. It all had to be paved. It all had to be paved. Well, it had to be paved 24 feet and 25. That's yeah. okay. That's where I heard. Okay. And that's that was serving how many? Two. Two units lots. or lots. Back back. Okay. Side by side, yeah. Okay. Okay, so I it, think I have myself there. So a condition requiring what a condition requiring city engineer uh, approval of their final driveway design um, satisfy the planning commission's concern about that width. Run that by me one more time. Yeah, I heard you say. If we're <laughs> if we have a condition in there that says that um, city engineer and public works need to approve the driveway width and design before they're allowed to pull any building permits, does that satisfy the concern? Only if he comes back and says 12 feet is required, then why do we have flag law standards 25? <laughs> and the, the other part of it is, is if there's somebody pulling out and there's somebody trying to make a left hand turn in there coming from the gas station, and that's a main arterial or whatever we classified that as, how much job? Yeah, how much jockeying is going to have to take place if there's only one slot? You know, if you have ingress and egress at the same time, you want it to be wide enough. And maybe it's a non issue. We'll have the applicant come up and talk, and uh, maybe they're planning on doing a 30 foot wide easement or bridge, and they're going to surprise us. <laughs> and, and... <laughs> <laughs> He's funny. Yeah. I just have one question. Is there parking allowed on 6th Avenue on the north side of the road no. currently? During a football game. <laughs> Don't get him going. Tara, you got any questions out there? Nope, I'm good. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question I had was lot coverage on duplexes on R1. Do we know that offhand? Lot coverages. Yeah, how much of the lot is allowed to be covered by a? Um, the lot coverage is currently the same for for any type 
of building in the R1 zone, and that is 55% of the lot. Now, I was just playing devil's advocate here. If you push that 55% at your initial go of putting the duplexes in, and then they're talking about ADUs, is there a reduction allowed? In the, is there a reduction allowed? In the law coverage. So as, a, as opposed to tearing off a roof and building up, uh -huh. if they want to build an accessory dwelling level or dwelling unit at ground level. Currently, we don't have a um, an exception for that, but I think that the proposed housing amendments, which are coming back to you next week, do include some exception. Okay. But currently, no exceptions. Okay. And while we're talking about that, lot coverage again um, and setbacks. If the flag lot cannot be considered, or if the, the stem of the flag lot cannot be considered for lot two, the back lot or north lot, which is front? That's a great question. Um, so the frontage is on Northwest 6th. The planning commission could require if you care about the orientation of the building, of the dwelling units, um, you could require it to be oriented whichever way you think is the most appropriate front, and that would be captured in the condition of approval. They would need to meet that in their building permit submittal, which we would review whenever we get those building plans, when we do development code review for buildings, um, if it matters to the planning commission. It's not spelled out, though, in the no, it's okay. not. Perfect. All right, I'll stop talking for a little bit. Anybody else have anything? Okay, let's go ahead and have the uh, applicant uh, come to the mic here. I've already read the statement about evidence presented at the hearing. If you could uh, provide your name and address, and then uh, if you can enlighten us with any of these questions we have, that would be helpful. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to find, excuse me, sorry. Michael Kerr, I'm at uh, 117 Northwest 6th, just Two doors down, I bought the Taylor's old place and fixed it up. You guys might know my house. Um, and yeah, so just, just so you know, we ha we've we had Don, or sorry, Public Works Director on the properties, walked the whole thing with me. And so we've answered a lot of these questions a couple months ago or whatever, specifically re with regards to water and the sewer. And um, the way I understand it, if this helps, um, we're we're treating the first the first um, the first building in the on the north side as a separate as a separate project. So there's existing water to the house. There's existing sewer lines to the house, and both of those would be used and utilized for that first that first building. However, when we go to the second um, plat or when the plat is done, and we go to that second one, we'll need to be bringing a new line, both for water and electricity. I'm sorry, water and sewer. And so that's where there was a distinction between those two. So we currently have sewer, we currently have water. They're actually on Carlton, I think was the, this, this is the, it's the um, dead end uh, from the elementary school. Carlton, yeah. Okay. Carlton, yeah. That's where the sewer is, just so you know. Um, there's a manhole there and that's where my, my sewer goes. And I think most of, um, Broadway runs along that line, and from there I don't know, but that's what he had, that's what he had told me. And just um, another thing I wanted to clarify: the intention for um, for pushing this forward, if you will, um, is that we have a current a great single mom and her teenage daughter who are living in the home, and my intention was to build them a new home to move to. And then to take down the first house so that we could continue in developing that first lot. And that was the whole intention for it was not a cart in front of the horse or some other weird thing that we had intended. So I don't know if there's any other questions um, specifically. I have a question for you. Do yeah. you plan on ADUs on these properties in the I, future? I, I, I do at the moment. Um, there will be parking. Um, there's, from what I can see, there'll be easily five or six parking spaces for each building without, you know, guaranteeing that, I guess, right now. But I, I know that there's going to be plenty of space along the whole frontage of the, each of those buildings for parking. 
and I'm planning to put um, garages in them as well. So there will be a driveway to to each one of them. Does that make sense? Are these kind of are you planning a single level or a two story? Two story, yeah, two story, kind of like a row house um, with the with the garage in the middle, and then I was going to have the ADU over the garage. Does that make sense? So the, sure. the ADU would separate the two duplexes and it kind of breaks it up and makes, you know, we have some dormers on the front and whatnot. Yeah. Would the buildings be identical or would they not? There's a little bit of, um, a little bit of work that's went into thinking through that. I think on the back, we're gonna, we're proposing a duplex where we were kind of waiting for the council to get a chance to look at the new the new um, development, development, developmental housing amendments. Housing amendments. Thank you for that verb or not noun. Um, to know if we might be able to put in a triplex. At this point, I'm I've kind of abandoned those pros those prospects for the back lot that might happen on the front. And if so, then I would use the same design and maybe just add a, a third unit on the front if that if that turns out to be feasible. Does that make sense? Going back to the sewer line, we talked about through with Dawn. Yeah. Is that a, a recorded easement that runs through there and like a non platted road? Or, I mean, I know we have a lot of these areas in town where there's like an alleyway or something lines up there. Sure. Um, and is when you're planning on doing those sewer line improvements, are you planning on improving it all the way from Carlton onto your property? Or are you going to punch the front house through across the <laughs> creek? And then catch something over there. Uh, so did, I'm not an expert on that at all. I'm really deferring most of that to Don. Um, but he had. It sounded like that's what his proposal was on that front property to use the existing one we have on the on the back, um, and then to punch through on the front. And I didn't at that point even know where the sewer lines were, but I assumed that he did. I know that I know that there's water right there, but I don't know exactly where the sewer is. Okay. It, can I just mention one other thing? Um, we hadn't, at least up until even speaking with Don about this three weeks ago, knowing if there was any engineering on the front improvements, if that's actually ready to be proposed, knowing that I live just two doors down, we we visited this a couple of years ago about um, putting sidewalks along Sixth Avenue on the north side of Sixth Avenue. But because uh, there was no plan at the time, at the time we we're in the middle of COVID, the whole world was upside down. I think we just we signed a note that well we'll we will take care of it when it happens, and so up until tonight, I think I didn't know that there was anything approved for sidewalks, and I don't think Don did either. Um, at least when I talked to him a week a month ago. Yeah, that's what um, that's what's indicated in the city engineer's comments is the the four and a half foot. Usually there would be a five foot wide sidewalk, and I think that's part of the engineering that they're. Prepared. Yeah, prepared. Yeah. Um, it'll be instead a four and a half foot wide sidewalk with curb. Um, and then he'll need to give you um the you know standards for like the creek stabilization sure. and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, we'll we can connect you with him and get all those specifics yeah. to you. Kurt has looked at this before in June. But mm -hmm. but yeah, without there's a <laughs> lot of things to be fleshed out, obviously. Any other questions? There's any other questions I have? The house in front, once yeah. the duplex is built, it will not be occupied. Exactly. I don't know how that transition takes place. And as I was reading your near new section 18, I guess what that means is I finish the building in the back, allow them to move into it, and then they're, you know, it is not double residency at any time. Is that right? Because that's my understanding. And I'm Totally good with that. Right. Um, it it's really just it'll be important for us to make sure that there's not a conditional use approval to permit a duplex on that new lot in addition to the existing single family home. So just sure. before the new lot line is recorded, um, you can either demolish the existing single family home or um indicate that you like. Right. For example, if you wanted to keep it for whatever reason, um, you have the option to mm -hmm. indicate that in writing and waive the conditional use approval to have 
to add a duplex to that lot. Okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, there was another thing that had come up about lot size. The, the actual partition proposal that I had made was kind of arbitrary to be really honest. So if we need 8,000 square feet on both, either lot, you know, we have enough room to push that line back two or three feet or whatever it takes to make that happen as well. We have a professional uh, surveying crew working on this right now. <clears throat> they came out last week. And so they're in the midst of that whole proposal, which I understand is a lot bigger, a bigger process than I even had any idea. So they'll be working on that for several months. You know, uh, with regards to not being able to record the lot line adjustment or partition, partition. until the home's demolished. What about pulling a building permit? Can you have a building permit open for a lot that doesn't necessarily exist? Um, the city can review a building permit for a lot that we have every reason to believe will soon exist, but we cannot issue a building permit until the lot line is recorded. So, so going back to timing of everything, if we can't do a build, I guess what, what takes place first, the variance? Us giving a variance saying, yes, you can build a duplex on whatever tax lot this is. Mm -hmm. The existing tax lot. The existing whole yeah, we can do that. acres. Mm -hmm. So we can give a variance to say, you're doing essentially a replacement dwelling. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And then once that replacement dwelling approaches final inspection or gets final inspection, the utilities have to be cut to the old house, demolished, and then all at once a lot line or a partition has to take place, creating an own lot, severing the utilities on that lot because it no longer belongs to the original parent lot. And then demolition and so there's a there's going to be a, a big like culmination of things happening at once but but going and then further dive into it half street improvements at what point in that process takes does that all take place the half street improvements either have to be completed or bonded for um, before we can approve the plat the sidewalks and the half street improvements include the pavement um, the pavement does not have to be done before we can issue the first building permit, but the sidewalks have to be done or bonded for before we can issue that building permit, first building permit. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm glad you clarified because I was worried about that myself. Okay. As long as somebody's we keeping track of it, it's not up. <laughs> there's going to be a lot going on and timing of everything and recording this before you can record that and building yeah. permit issuance versus final inspection and demolition and all that is going to be a lot. Yeah. And not right. going and fetching sewer from somewhere that you're going to have to go blast through brand new sidewalks and pavement mm -hmm. or oh. any of that. Yeah. And then the other thing, just I build houses for a living. And so the first thing that came to my mind was typically the worst thing for any road or bridge or concrete pavement whatever is construction construction itself and so taking a fully loaded concrete truck over a bridge that you don't know the rating on kind of mm -hmm. scares me yeah and so having somebody either assess that bridge to make sure it's okay for temporary construction mm -hmm. or or do that pump, pump it in which is was one of our other cons considerations but a bumper pump, on the on the street there's still a lot of heavy things that happen. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Yeah, there is. There is. But that, that was definitely a consideration. And the bridge is 12 feet, by the way. Okay. Um, barely, but it, it is 12 feet. But um, that's another thought I'll have to talk to Kurt about. Okay. All right. Planning Commission, is there anything else while we stand in? I, I had one, but you made me forget it. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. sorry. Great. I, I should have written it that's down. That's great. Dara, anything out there? Did she drop off? No, I'm here. I just, sorry, I, I uh, couldn't find the unmute. No, I'm good. You guys are asking uh, great questions. And um, yeah, I'm all set. Okay. Well, perfect. Thank you for coming up and uh, kind of clarifying some of that stuff. Sure. And we might call you back if we get 
do another one. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to speak on behalf or against this application? Okay, doesn't look like anybody's jumping up. So let's do this. Let's jump back into our planning commission meeting here. Um, and we have a list of options that'll pop up on the screen here. Oh. Same as always, we have approve with conditions, approve with conditions, and we can add things uh, or delete things if necessary, and then uh, deny. This is our decision. It doesn't go to the city council, it's, right? Correct. Um, so here we are. Uh, I guess I move to recommend with conditions all eight of 18 of them. And I apologize for not putting this on the screen, but um, just want to confirm you're not including a condition. This motion does not include requiring the minimum 8,000 square feet for duplexes okay. or do you want to include oh, that no, in the motion? But you said that in the report. Did you? You want to include that then? Yes. Okay. So, so then total 19 conditions. Got it. Right. You have 19 conditions and if council changes them, they can actually apply for the lesser square footage. Right. The condition, I'll go. Right. Currently they're at 8,000. If the council changes things, yeah, that's right. We have a motion for 19 conditions. Right. And we got a second. <laughs> okay. Do we need to include anything explicitly about the 12 foot access versus 25 foot access on the bridge or box culvert as it may be? Okay. Any other discussion? Okay. You guys got it. You guys are sure you got all this laid out. But is this the planning department? Well, or now department? you're making me question things. <laughs> you got well, the it's minutes. both. It's you, both, and it's public works, and it's you fire. Got the minutes all taken care, of, right? Yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> I'm gonna watch that. <laughs> I, I do have a question. Um, the person that sent those down, are they neighbors or just concerned citizens? I don't know who Michael Cannon is or Connor. Thank you for bringing this up because I forgot about this sitting here. They seem to be pretty concerned. No, it's just got a name and a phone number. Thank you for, yeah, I can um, read that allowed for the record. So I think, when did we receive this? Yeah, that, oh, uh, today. Today. Okay, so this is a piece of testimony received today from Michael K. Cannon that says, currently there is one house and one family residing at this address. The proposal will increase that to four families and two larger buildings, two cars to eight cars. So no, I'm not in favor of this. Then there's the matter of the two and a half acres next door. The new buyer, if this is approved, will want how, how many? many duplexes for his property? Still low density? If he wants to split his property, fine, but we are not in favor of duplexes. Is it possible to bring the map back up that showed where this lot is? Yes. And yes. then um, I'd like to know which two and a half acres next door he's concerned about. There's one to the uh, acre to the west and an acre to the back. Well, the greenhouse is just, yeah. Yeah, and that was the old love gas station right across the street. It's the old food truck. Right. Very close. I don't know all those names like you do. <laughs> <laughs> We've been here a while, but it's still. See. Okay. So this is the applicant's property. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm assuming the two acre, two and a half acres next door would be this direction. Right at the end, yeah. And that's the property that's currently for sale. Two and a half acres. The that oh. piece and then the piece directly to the north of it right. is right. The yeah, same ownership. Okay. I think it's 2.01 acres. <clears throat> <coughs> okay. I mean, do we have to? I mean, we have acknowledged this, right? So I mean, right. it's in the record. Okay. I don't feel comfortable with my my motion. Okay. Uh, if there's no further discussion or questions, we'll just go ahead and vote on this. So everybody in favor, please raise your right hand. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Was that a you got that, Brian? Yep. All right. Thank you. All right. Good luck in the process here. And you talking to the right we'll people here, up. they'll they'll help you through the, the rest of it. Um shouldn't be any reason for appeal at this point in time. So with that, let's jump into item three on our or item C questions and answers with the city manager. A time of discussion and roles and responsibilities for planning commissioners, including the flexibility to address decisions for the community. Good evening, Melanie, Miss City Manager. How are you? Fantastic. Good. That was very complicated, um, just because just to sit here and watch and listen. And um, so this is kind of why we're doing this tonight, um, just to manage expectations. I'm not a planner. I remember Bill Elliott when he came. One thing he made very clear is he is not a planner. I'm like, why does he keep saying that? Um, but he, it's it's a very special, um, specialized area of work that. Our planning staff does, um, used to be the county, and now we have our very own staff, which is really great, better access for people here in the community. And then what the work that you all do on the planning commission, um, I'm sure you can, you have a lot of experience. I think even though Dee Dee's new, I think that um, you probably know just, you know, a lot about how to manage all this stuff. So I'm here because you are you used to, you've always made difficult decisions, um, but now they are coming at you fast and furious. And it's, I think it's challenging. Um, and so we have this um, Oregon Planner Commission, Planning Commissioner Handbook, um, which I read and highlighted it all you know, all through it. Um, but I just kind of wanted to see if you guys have questions and I may not be able to answer them, but maybe maybe planning staff can. I think that we need to find out where you have or clarify where you have flexibility to make decisions um, and where, you know, because there's a lot of places that your hands are tied. If they make conditions of approval, then you have to just approve it. So where do you have flexibility in making decisions and how can you apply the values of our community, which is changing? Um, I don't know that the values are changing. Some of them are, but are, um, you need to apply the values of, the to, of our community to these decisions and to the interpretation of our policies and all that. So um, just to start out, does anybody have questions um, or ideas. I think, yeah, I think Rick. Um, do we have a vision for the for Estacada? What we want to look like in 20 years, 40 years, 60 years? What what do you want that to look like? All right. Good question. I think Taylor and her team have been working on that a little bit this summer with the questions at, at what's up Estacada? We tried to put up some questions um, at council meetings on like on the flip chart so people could just give us some feedback on what do you like about Estacada? What do you want to stay the same? What do you want to change? And we haven't gotten a ton of feedback on that. That's just kind of our first initial um, 
just kind of a random gathering of information. But Taylor, do you want to talk about the idea for this? That's a very sure. good, good question because we don't necessarily, we have like the city council several years ago developed a mission and um, we have like a vision statement in our Estacada downtown or Riverside area plan about what Estacada is going to look like. But I think that that's a key point. And Taylor's been very interested in working on that. So if you want to speak to it a little bit. Yeah, ideally. So short answer is no. <laughs> but um, ideally, the city would have a, a community vision that's developed with like a broad range and um, large percentage of community members. Um, and that vision would guide the all kinds of city documents, including the comprehensive plan, which has, you know, the 14 different goal categories and the comprehensive plan guides the development of the development code and updating the development code um, and other things. So um, we, our comprehensive plan has a lot of outdated chapters. We're working on up to updating two of them right now, the housing chapter, um, and then also the transportation chapter, which we just started the update to the transportation system plan. Um, but a lot of the other chapters haven't been updated in a very long time. Um, and those updates ideally should be guided by a sort of broad, like high level, future looking kind of positive community vision. Um, there are, you can hire consultants to do a visioning process. Um, you can also do um, regular kind of incremental visioning activities with, you know, members of the public and city boards. Um, and that's something that we've started trying to do when, we, when we're able and when we have time. Um, is we've been, yeah, including visioning, just little visioning questions. You know, what's, when you think about Estacada thriving in 10 or 20 years, what do you see, you know, stuff like that? Or what makes you feel safe in Estacada? You know, we've, we've got kind of a list of questions going, but um, that's something that, um, yeah, we're gonna continue doing incrementally as we're able. We are uh, documenting and saving all of the input that we get about those questions in the drive for use at a future date. I, I personally would love for us to eventually do um, like a formal visioning process that is really robust, involves a broad range of community members, um, but it's, you know, cost money and staff time and all, all that stuff. Um, that is also something that the planning commission could, you know, usually the way we've been, the way I've always known the city to run planning commission meetings is if there's a land use application, we hold a planning commission meeting. Um, but other cities, planning commissions have meetings that are kind of more like what our council meetings look like, where maybe they'll have, and kind of like what this meeting looks like, maybe they'll have land use applications that they have to review in a public hearing, um, but they'll also have a discussion about some topic. Um, and that could be visioning, you know, talking about uh, a specific issue around transportation or a project that, I don't know, it could be anything related to planning. In a public so, forum. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Is that something that you all would be interested in? I know, you know, uh, time is at a premium and it's, you're, you're busy. I know you're busy, but um, is this something you're... Would it be, you know... I think if it would be possible to get some kind of a survey, and I've considered even just walking around my neighborhood and asking people, do you have a series of questions? Because I thought about doing that. I could just walk around the neighborhood because I walk those neighborhoods up on Reagan Hill all the time. And just asking people, what do you want it to look like? You know? Yeah, I think that's cool. We, when we do like an online survey, we only hit a certain number of people. Like when we want to put the park in an overlook, we had the guys go out and do door hanger surveys on all the houses around that neighborhood because we thought we need to get these to each of these houses. Um, so yeah, I think that we could 
we that's one thing we could work on yeah i don't know could we get a grant <laughs> hire a bunch we of might, kids we hire, get them from the high school or something psu there, came out in canvas psu came out years ago to do like a public safety survey for that and they canvassed all the neighborhoods i think that i think they were only here one day it might have been two days i can't remember um but yeah we might be able to do something like that um i i think from uh from what i understood from what john said there are grants available for updating a comprehensive plan and and doing those kinds of things um I think we might have just missed one deadline for some stuff, but I, I mean, I think that I think we are just operating as as this uh, as a zoning board, and I think that's part of what is creating this friction is because we don't have, you know, every everything we get, we get this these these parameters okay you can only decide on this according to these parameters and we don't have any we don't any bigger visioning discussion we don't have any way to address you know the the kind of high level of what seems to be community concern with what's going on the level of personal concern that we all have about what's going on we don't have ongoing updates on where things like the the sewage or the um, school stuff, you know, even things that we can't legally decide things based on. It, it seems weird that we're the planning commission and we don't know where a lot of, you know, where a lot of those things are at. And like this, even this planning <coughs> document on page 17, number five, it says, outline a year's work on active planning and stick to it. Do not confuse development per permit processing reactive planning or plan review with real planning. And that's, to me, that's kind of the crux of what we're doing is just permit processing. And it, you know, it sounds like that's what the planning commission has been in the past, but we are, the city is growing at an absolutely insane rate. And we are, you know, a bunch of people that could, could be, you know, we could be doing more active stuff. We could be, we could sort of function as a committee that's an adjunct to doing what the staff, you know, it, like helping the staff do stuff that they don't have time or, you know, whatever it is for. I just, I just feel like we're, we could, if we had more of a, of a structured process, we would have ways to address a lot of these concerns that, that just come up in, in the heat of a decision. And then everybody wants to talk about big issues and then there's no space to do that in, in the context of the decision. If that made sense. Yeah, thanks, Tara. Did Richard have a, he's trying to raise his hand. Some of you may have not been born when Tom and I started coming to these meetings. And uh, Possibly so. <laughs> he's been longer than I have committed to this city. And uh, we, uh, 95, I believe, when I started, he was already on the planning commission for several years. And then we went through 10 or 12 years as a council. So we saw both ends of this, but they brought out uh, rural development issues. Mm -hmm. And they had a big forum in here. They put on a pretty good program. They were trying to see what the residents would like to see 20 years, which would have been five or so years ago and they came up well they wanted a double double street both ways and they wanted to see sidewalks they wanted to see parking they wanted to see common sense and uh, you know they they all had different colors what their first choice was and there was a lot of wanting better streets and we uh, put infrastructure they wanted the streets first, mm -hmm. but I made the question to them, would you like us to pave the street or would you like to see like, we have a city next to us down here in Clackamas that put, they paved their street and then they put a water line in, a sewer line in, and then they put a storm drain in. And so they were striped all the way <laughs> down their city. And they said, let's put the infrastructure in the ground and the phone company and, and the city. Uh, 
at that time, they said the city didn't have any wooden water lines. Well, I blew them out of the water with that one. I was a kid. They dug holes. I looked in there, you know, 50, 60 years ago. And guess what? We tore them out and replaced them. And it took, I don't think we've replaced all our water lines at all. But it was a start. We haven't had to dig up our streets until we have to put some new sewer lines for these little subdivisions. But, you know, then, that's the way it's done. That's a great example for prioritizing uh -huh. the timing of things. Did you like the process with RDI or? I, I, I participated in it mm -hmm. and watched it. A lot of people were involved in it. Really? A lot of, a lot of citizens meeting inside the city, yeah. city. And of course we have now exterior business people that don't have a boat because they live outside the city. Lucky people sometimes. <laughs> but you know, we, 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 set aside what was your top goal. And uh, they did a pretty good, I don't remember their names, but I remember what they looked like. But they'd be a lot older now, so am I. But we, uh, that was in 95, and they wanted to do the comprehensive plan with Lake Worth Music for the next 20 years. And so here we are trying to make plans for what do you want to see for the next 20 years. And I feel old. <laughs> but what I think the city of Escada should go look at is quality of life, common sense, and <clears throat> stop putting Pandora's box first and opening the lid. Um, you know, we have, uh, well, Ben, for instance, has been working within our code of the 16th to build houses and lots and roads and he's done it all. I kept a little bit of the fringe, you know, curb, sidewalk, whatever needs to be finished. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we've all got some expertise. I know uh Dee worked for the city of Decker yeah, for several years. Mm -hmm. And so she's got a lot of experience mm -hmm. with, with what's going on. So we all bring something to the table and that's wonderful. And yeah. I kind of like to think that, well, I hope I haven't forgot some, most of the stuff I ever learned. But I grew up here, I will someday, maybe with help, who knows. <laughs> um, ben, you got anything to go with that? I think quality of life is the biggest mm -hmm. one we need to put, so. our, put our feet into first, rather than, you know, just but, say, yeah. make it easy for the development. And I think that what you're saying about the the level of time commitment and the expertise that you all have. Um, I know, I mean, you've been here for a long time and you're not planning on leaving anytime soon, but I think, you know, eventually you're probably going to want us to be free of this. Before that happens, I think taking advantage of the accumulative years of experience and knowledge that you all have and doing, getting into this planning process and having you guys help us lead that with the city council but you as a planning commission, I think, I think that would be really great if you're up for it. Um, sometimes staff tries to take on stuff to eliminate you know, or alleviate a burden on volunteers. And there is a lot of work that staff has to do, um, but we are, we got staff now. So we could do, if, do that. And if you guys are up for participating or have ideas, and we could talk about this at your next meeting a little bit too, we could add a little, something on the end, if you want to kind of chew on the ideas, um, see what you think. I think it's a good idea. There was another meeting that happened maybe about 2017. I could be wrong on the year, but it was held in this room and it was talking about the sidewalks and the roads mm -hmm. and lakeshore and various places. And we did the same thing. We put the little colored tags on what we felt was the most important. And there was a pretty good turnout. Mm -hmm. Wasn't um, the, the forefront of that one? Yeah, there was that so. one meeting. Yeah. That was, yeah, I think that was our active transportation plan. It was. We also then updated our parks master plan um, and that had a lot of community. So we've had like pockets of community involvement in a variety of things, but I think where you guys come in is that overarching, like you said, quality of life. What's mm -hmm. our town gonna look like? Like if you um, 
have the ghost of Christmas past come and visit you someday and they bring you back to Estacada or Christmas future, whichever one it would be, and you see what it looks like, what do you want it to look like? Is it going to be, how can we make it turn out so people love it 20 years from now as much as we do? Right. Yeah. We're looking at a, a lot of um, single family homes and multi-family now coming mm -hmm. into the city, but Outside of the industrial park, I don't see a lot of businesses coming into the city. And those businesses are going to keep our town stable and provide jobs for the homes that we're building, for the people that live in those homes. You got a middle middle housing, but currently what I see is young people moving out of their parents' home need a place to live. They want to stay in the community. But we're also bringing other people into the community. Um, right now, we do have a grocery store, but every day I hear somebody, well, I shop at Fred Meyers or I shop at Safeway. Um, the business aspect of it is just as important as the living mm -hmm. aspect. Yeah. Sometimes even more. Yeah, I mean, it's I, I, we don't, that grocery store, you could not really do all of your shopping there. It's really expensive and not super you know not always well stocked we don't have a bank even you know there's just a lot of stuff that we don't really have and we're we're gonna have ten thousand people here did you mean bank did you mean bank we have two banks what's that did you mean we don't have a bank or did you mean something else oh i i've uh I have not seen, uh, sorry, th there's like the local bank, but there's not, um, uh, maybe I'm missing a bank. <laughs> so we have we have US Bank and Key Bank. Key bank. Oh, you um, do, okay. We, we don't have like, we don't have a little credit union or I mean, there's other things, you know, that we don't have. When I was growing up, you, <coughs> you know, you going out of Estacada was a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like we go out of, out of town all the time. And, you know, you bought your, your Levi's at the, where Mossy Rock is now. There, was, I remember there was a little store there. I can't remember what it was called. Um, and there was a washer and dryer store. And there was, you know, there was like three grocery stores. And it was just, it was different because you, you lived here, you worked here, you shopped. Everything was like right here every once in a while. I mean, Clackamas Town Center didn't even exist um, until I was like 10. And so it was just, it was here. We didn't have Amazon driving stuff into town every day. It was a different, very different life. To my house. I, I know, it was a very different life. And I don't know if, you know, we'll ever, we probably won't ever go back to that again. But what, you know, what do we want to try to bring forward? Uh, Melanie, you can probably relate to this a little bit because uh, Randy Ely is the one who got me involved with all the city stuff. <laughs> uh, and he he took myself and my wife out to lunch or dinner or whatever it was and he said one of you guys needs to run for city council and I got voluntold that I was going to do it and I <laughs> haven't really left because I now I'm on the planning commission but one of his visions way back then which would have been 2006 seven ish mm -hmm. was that we go the other way from the the opposite way of the middle housing and that we provide move up housing for these people that live in, you know, the entry level, the first time homes. And I remember his vision as he explained it to me was where Campanella Estates is now was something totally different than it is currently of paved wide streets, no sidewalks, and just kind of a meandering paved road that went through there. Like many estates kind of. Yeah, many estates, quarter acre lots, half acre lots. With and That's why we hired on the council because he had this vision that it could have worked if you would stuck around. Yeah. Well, and it's not, it's not too late. Um, and and the market's going to do what the market's going to do, I suppose. With the, the reason why we're building tons and tons of single family houses is because people are buying tons and tons of single family houses. That yeah, and they, and they fit in that price range and you know, what, how much house you can get for a dollar amount. And I, I would like to see a shift some at some point in time and, and whether it's going to be locally or nationally or worldly, globally, um, I, I feel like there's going to be a, a correction of some sort. But 
I would like to see that we retain people that want to be here because the step up from somebody that wants to live on a 7,000 square foot lot is somebody that wants to live on a half acre lot. Well, there's nothing in town. I mean, we're currently dividing one of them into put two duplexes on it. So, I mean, the, the next step up is, okay, we're going to, we still want to stay in Escada, but we're moving out of the city limits. And so I think that, and that's kind of where I was at when I had to move from city council to the planning commission. And this isn't a history lesson about me, by, by the way, but it's just the natural progression of how, how things go. Still very much community uh, centric and, and focused, but as they move out, their voices get diluted but they still have Estacada at their heart. I, mm -hmm. My mom, before I came down here, she's pissed because, wow, why are you doing all these planning or these subdivisions? And it's like, well, we're, we're limited by this box and the rules. Now, I, I at a personal level, I don't like houses that are five feet apart mm -hmm. uh, and wouldn't want to live there myself, but there's obviously people that do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I don't know where I'm going with this other than I, I think in the city itself needs to figure out a way to make it easy for developers to go either direction, the middle housing way or something more um, half acre lot with a 30 by 30 shop where they can put their boats. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to write them a code violation every two weeks because your boat's in your front yard. I mean, cause that's a, that's a real thing. It, is. it totally is. Yeah. Um, and at the same time, you're, you're, I guess building your bench and retaining people within the city limits that can fill spots on this and fill spots on city council because it's a lot of the same faces year after year or every term cycle. Um, but there's a lot of people in the periphery that have good ideas or are business owners within the city limits that have, have decided to move up and out. Um, so I, like I said, I don't know where I'm going with that, but somehow whatever we do, we need to incorporate more than just city proper to the community because everybody's dealing with the traffic. Everybody's dealing with their kids dropping off at school and it's chaos or the lack of law enforcement as some people want to get on their horse and talk about and um, the smell of the wastewater treatment plant, whether it's because there's too many people pooping or because we're not dealing with it right or you know whatever it is, uh, everybody's dealing with it, not just right. the city of. Right. So. Yeah, it's hard. I like, I like the idea of like you called the move up housing um, although I don't think I've ever moved up, we just, <laughs> we just stayed put. Um, but it's, I think right now we're kind of being the, the push is to do the middle housing and the push from the state is middle housing, you know, make, make, um, so inside the urban growth boundary, it's going to get developed and full of people, but then you don't have, like you said, you don't have that half acre lot. You can't move out in the county. You can't say, okay, I'm jumping out of town into the county. Now you got five acres or 80 acres. And you and that's a big jump from, um, you know, what if we could do some of that. So we have middle housing, we have apartments, we have single family, family housing, we have more businesses. So people work in town, hopefully. And then I don't know how if we make, like we don't, we don't require, I don't think we require parks. Um, in our code when they're developing and or they develop in little tiny sections. Oh, it's only 30 houses. There's not room for a park. But the next thing you know, they've got three or four of those going. And, um, you know, maybe if, if that's something um, we've, I think we've recently added in like setbacks on riparian areas. I think that kind of helps. Um, but yeah, it's just ideas. Like, I think it takes putting our heads together and getting <laughs> the rest of the community, whoever can get involved and and put that vision together, which is a, it's probably a two-year process, maybe? I don't know. Depends. Yeah. Depends. Yeah. Well, we've been discussing medium middle class housing and stuff. We're, we're going down to tiny, tiny lots, which I was strictly against way back when we started it over here. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. However, what we haven't discussed is those tiny lots or tiny houses that they're building up there on Wildcat, right in the guy's shop. He's building four at a time. Yeah. And uh, they're moving them, you know, all over Oregon. Some of them from private residents and some are just the city. You know, they come in on wheels and they're like, you know, how big were those, Ben? Did you see that? They're, they're only like 10 feet wide and they're like, yeah, they're like 300 feet long, yeah, two or three stories, and, and 
and with the wooden trailer house. Yeah, pretty nice. What it is. Yeah, but anyway, it, it's a it trend comes, right now. It comes with everything miniaturized, and I'm not saying it's just for short people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. But it, it, you know, for a bachelor pad, you know, they, they don't come with a, a lot of uh, storage for extra stuff, like you said, with boats, mm -hmm. kayaks, stuff like that. It doesn't come with a storage unit to go along with. You know, and they've all also been building houses out of these containers mm -hmm. off of ships and stuff. And that is a fabulous idea. However, uh, I'm sure it comes with its own mess of bugs that come, come <laughs> with it. I mean, when I say bugs, uh, issues that you okay. deal with Not for insulation, putting windows okay. in, and that kind of stuff. But I know- Think cute ones more. though, yeah. like that, yeah. You know, they're utilizing something that there's an excess of that doesn't house it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I could see, you know, you see Good. the pants, they all have a cubicle like a beehive, <laughs> climb up, climb in, and sleep, and then you leave. And go to work. And go to work. Yeah. But is that what you want Escada to become? <laughs> a beehive? Yeah. Well, fortunately, uh, we're not no. like New York with row houses. I, I've seen some of those apartments, and I'm like, I could never live in a place like that. I, Long, dingy halls with just doors. <laughs> you know, uh, when the mayor was the minister, I can't remember. Brett? Brett. Him and I had a meeting. Uh, when I lived in Hawaii, I worked for Habitat for Humanity. And that is one of the best ways for step-up housing mm -hmm. because the people have to put in X amount of hours to get it built. But uh, there was a lot of people like myself that worked there that had built homes before and had the experience and it, it worked out great. The people were great. Wow. They got a new home, uh, it, you know, basically. And I think the state of Hawaii, what they did is they came in and they either got the property somehow, put in the, the utilities under like an LID or something, and then the people paid for it after they got their house built and they moved in. And there were some fantastic families that got new homes. Wow. You know, it, it was a great experience mm -hmm. for me. Wow, that's cool. I have a question regarding that um, since you brought it up. Have there ever been homes built in Estacada through Habitat for Humanity? No. Well, do you think there ever would be? You have to call the fellow that's in charge of that corporation. He's in Portland. And uh, when I left Hawaii, they told me it's going to be hugely different when you go back to the mainland. And they were right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's way different over there. They're mm -hmm. uh, much more community oriented, you know, anti. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and they're all related. <laughs> so, you know, but it's real different. But it doesn't, doesn't, it's not that it's not possible. You just have to, you know, somebody has to go and investigate it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd be willing to try again. Mm -hmm. I'll call the guy. Okay. Yeah. So that would be that'd be great. It takes so, land, dirt. It takes dirt. Mm -hmm. but does the city have parcels that they own that they pick up through tax liens or whatever? I don't think we have any right now. We had like a few little odds and end pieces. I don't know how we got them, um, but we did a, an auction for those several years ago. Um, so I don't think we have any right now, but I mean, if that was an option, that'd be something to, to consider though. So, and I don't want to keep you guys here too long, but I think to summarize what I'm hearing is there is some interest in some proactive planning, some strategic planning for the city or visioning that you guys would be interested in. We could continue this conversation on. I think you'd like to have, um, like maybe tonight after the you know, your land use stuff that you do um, to have an update, maybe have public works director come one time, have um, the, no, I can't, yeah, the engineer or we could, up, yeah, or even oh, probably the engineer. I'm like, I could give you a little update on the financing we're looking for, for the wastewater treatment plant and stuff like that. But yeah, just to kind of, and maybe have somebody coming from schools, although Ben, probably you could probably fill us in a little bit on that. I don't know if you want to give updates on that or, yeah, I, I can. I, you know, stuff like that. If we could have little updates 
like each time. So you're continuing to be educated about what's going on because um, there's so much going on. It's hard to, it's hard for us to keep up with what's, what it all. So if we give you updates, um, if we talk about visioning, um, um, oh, my other thing, the, the stuff that you review is rather complex. And I think a question came up about being able to ask staff about that ahead of time. And the concern was for, is, is that okay to do, to talk about it ahead of time? And we believe that that is okay. Taylor and I were talking about, I do that with the council. Every Friday before a meeting on Monday, I will call each one of them. I'll go over what I think are like, okay, these are the highlights of what's in the agenda. Um, and just give them a little bit of background and then ask if they have questions. And you are all dealing with such complicated um, issues. Like I would come in kind of, I mean, I kind of knew what this, that partition question was about, but when you start hearing the details, I'm like, I don't even know what they're asking you. Um, and so, you know, if you have things to talk about ahead of time so that you don't have to like come here um, with questions unanswered and you can still ask the questions because then, you know, if somebody that way, if somebody's listening or somebody's sitting here, you know, they probably have the same question that you had, but at least you're coming in with a better picture. And Taylor, that we believe that is all right. But do you guys have questions about that? Has yeah. that been vetted? We could, well, vetted through. The it would just process. need to be so if it's for a land use application that's like specific to a property and like an applicant then that's when it matters whether or not there's been ex parte contact and ex parte contact just needs to be disclosed. It doesn't, it doesn't um, prevent you from voting or participating normally in the hearing. It just needs to be disclosed at the hearing. So we would say either you or staff, I mean, staff could summarize what was discussed or you could I don't know. You could do that at the beginning of the hearing. I'm not sure when that happens in the hearing, but um, yeah, it would just need to be disclosed at the hearing. With, and the, with the middle housing update and all that, since it's kind of a city planning driven or, or facilitated, and then we're voting on that. Obviously, you guys have a, a direction that we're heading with it. Is, do you feel that break is as clean? That, yes, because that is legislative. You're I think if I understand your question right, um, that it's still okay to talk ahead of time. Like we've been meeting with counselors, not more, not a quorum, mm -hmm. but meeting with them to answer questions and get their priorities. Cause we would really like to have you all involved in the year plus process that has been going on versus something coming to you. And you're like, oh, you guys have been working on a housing needs analysis. That's nice. Would have been nice if you let us know. And so we've been trying to involve you, but even if you have been involved along the way, um, it, I think what you're asking is if it's a legislative thing that you're making a recommendation on, is it still okay to talk to staff? And in that case, I that is absolutely. Yeah, um, definitely. Mm -hmm. And in that case, it it I believe it <clears throat> would not count as ex parte contact if it's not a, yeah, Brian just oh, was. Reading this. In the handbook, in the end, it has definitions, and one of them is the ex parte, and it specifically says that if it's talking about land or um, code amendments, that it doesn't count as ex parte, and that's in that handbook. Nice. Thank you. So, when I was on the city council, we had a citizen that likes to send people to the ethic committee. Sorry. Um, so basically, I ended up down in Salem because they said I was talking to the city manager before the meeting. Okay. Then let's get, let me contact the, like if there could be some ethics training. But, yeah, but maybe that's. I, then I, after the meeting, I went inside to talk to the, the big shot at the time. And he said, you didn't do anything wrong. Okay. Right. You can talk to the city manager. If you can't talk to the city manager, you aren't doing your job. Mm -hmm. So, but this was 20 years ago, so mm -hmm. it could have changed. And we could do some research, and so that you're not just taking that from our word, but you know, either have somebody well, come in or see, have some training. See, and you know, the ex part of contact, mm -hmm. you know, I was also on the council and I was here at the planning commission. 
that's when you know ex part of contact is when you sitting in a meeting, they talking about it, then you're going to vote for it at, on the city mm -hmm. council level. And that should be disclosed, right? right? That right. you have you have gathered information right. prior to the public and, hearing. See, they, they explained that all to me. Yeah. And of course, they wanted to find the people that filed the complaint wanted them to find me big bucks. They didn't do it. I did not. They let me off. <laughs> well, Tom, you left out. When Tom and I got on the city council in 95, I believe, yep. we didn't just listen to people in the audience who come up and say, we got a trouble. You know? We knew about it ahead of time. He and I, we went and looked at the problem that they identified. We didn't always talk to the people themselves. Mm -hmm. That would be ex parte. Mm -hmm. But we went and looked, put ourselves in their shoes, looked at the problem. And then when we got there, they said, okay, you brought us this problem. We're going to ask you what you think the answer is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody can come to a meeting mad. Mm -hmm. we, we made it a policy at that time. If you're going to bring us a problem, what do you think the answer to it? The fix it. Mm -hmm. And it helped a great deal. Good idea. So that's been, we've been off council for what, 14 years? Yeah, more than um, that. I have a... <laughs> I have a couple of quick questions. Um, I know it's getting close to nine, but um, one question would be, can slash should we be required to go to things that like the the housing, the the housing workshops where it's supposed to be us in the city council um, or any other, you know, things that are really big, really obvious planning commission things. Can we be required to go to things outside of our meetings? And then my second question is, um, I really, I really thought the training with John was great and it was super helpful. And um, I wonder if he might be a worthwhile resource to bring back to talk about how we can move the planning commission from being more of a zoning board thing to something that's more proactive so, so that we have somebody with a lot of experience helping us move into another phase rather than just, you know, kind of having having some discussions on the agenda, which is great, but maybe maybe there are some really concrete things that we can do. And I, I think he'd be a great person. That's a good suggestion. I think I think we try not to make meetings mandatory. But kind of kind of we'd like to require, I mean we would like to require you to be there if it's a like a joint meeting with the council. Um, but we trust you guys, I guess, to make sure, you know, that you're you have you have the rest of your life too. And so how you can prioritize that. And if, if you say, Oh, I can't be there, we, we figure it's something important, not just that you didn't really feel like doing it that night. So you got any of those scheduled so, coming up? No, we had one. When, I don't know, a few months ago we had one. Dee Dee wasn't on yet, I don't think. Who, a I don't, joint workshop? The joint workshop, yeah, yeah. It was at the end of June, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and see, and that's, so, and now we have Zoom, which is helpful. So if you're out of town, if you have internet, you know, you could Zoom in. Um, we also like for you to be, like when we have open houses and the public is here, um, you know, come and get the feel for what's going on. and. You can even give your input as a private, you know, as an individual um, at that point and help like share your opinions with us along the way um, before we get to the a formal review process. Um, so we would like, we'd like to have more of that, but we trust you guys to know, you know, how to prioritize your schedule. So yeah, required is, a, is bold, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. <laughs> more strongly suggested is more, yeah. is, is more likely to be yeah. applicable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and with the schedule, it's far in advance. It's hard. Is, uh, the further in advance we can schedule things, the better. Okay. Yeah. Um, Busy. Busy family. So I'll try to be here more frequently, but I, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll try to make them like specific things that we say this thing, this would be helpful for you. And if not everybody can come to it, 
Um, we, we certainly understand, but like if we're having an open house or if we're having a what's up SDK, we could try to keep you more informed. So if it does fit in your schedule and you want to pop in, you can do that. Um, and then if it's like a joint work session, sometimes those are harder to schedule because there's so many people's moving parts to coordinate, but um, we'll try to do good at picking a, usually it's on a Monday because that's when a council meeting is, but we don't have to, they could pick a different night too. You know, come on your Thursday nights or something. Right, the next council meeting is the 26th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so now at your next meeting, you'll be making a recommendation, hopefully, if um, you can, yeah. So if you have questions between now and then, Taylor and Alan and Brian, yeah. Because I, I also read in this book, we're supposed to be a team. And so we, I think we- <laughs> You had to read that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm like, I felt like it's, you know, there's like this, this break between, okay, this is staff, and we have to work here and we're supposed to know the answers. And then you're the committee that's supposed to ask the hard questions and make sure that we're on track. And, but we're actually supposed to be a team and working together on this. Um, so I think that I think that will help. And I did remember, I want to remind you guys that we used to have to vote on annexation mm -hmm. just a few years ago. And the state took that away from us. And LOC fought, the League of Oregon Cities fought for that not to happen because they believe in home rule. Um, and it did it didn't matter the state took it away anyway so now you know we are we're faced with annexation so by property or you know i mean that's the thing you can do you can if people stop selling their property to developers but what are you going to do you know that's what with the urban growth boundary it's supposed to develop inside the boundary which i just really realized <coughs> probably a year ago it finally dawned on me that oh all this is all supposed to be city one day i'm like it was shocking. It was shocking to me because that's always been as it is. And I thought it was always going to stay. Yeah, it's always going to stay that way. I mean, I can't even picture it how it is now, but we're growing and there's the, you know, private property owners, they do have a right to do what their zoning will allow their property to do. But we need to get, like you're saying, proactive, make these um, long-term visions so that we can make sure our policies meet that. And that gives um, the planning commission, the city council, more teeth to make sure that SK is turning out how we want it and how the community values want it. So anyway. Can I ask a three-pronged question? Oh, okay. So going back to the wastewater treatment plant. Yes. Where are we at with that? Yes. How much water can we legally pull out of the Clackamas River okay. for fresh water? And, and where is that in relation to what we're pulling out right now? Uh, and then the third one is, how how do we get some teeth with ODOT, and as far as making improvements outside of the city limits, because okay. everybody complains about the Carver curves and Spring Water Road and you know, everything else, but it's no different than when we tell somebody to do a half street improvement that's half in Clackamas County and half in the city limits. Mm -hmm. We really don't have any jurisdiction outside of where mm -hmm. the dotted line is. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, for the wastewater treatment plant question, we are working on getting funding for that. Um, and we, DEQ says they'll fund the whole thing, which is a relief. However, it's not a great deal right now. So I think the plan is to start working with them so we can get just the engineering, design engineering permitting piece of that financed, which is, they, they recommended looking at the numbers in our plan, three and a half million dollars. They said we don't have to use all that, but we could, if we request that, then we've got it if we need it. And then after the first of the year, when more rules come out about the um, bipartisan infrastructure law, and there's supposed to be all this money available for infrastructure, um, then we will revisit what we can get for building the plant. Because right now, all the most we can get is half a million dollars in the forgivable loan. And you're talking about a $25 million project. So we are hoping 10 million. I mean, I'm hoping 10 million or more in forgivable loan or grant. But no, no, it has to build the whole plant. Yeah. 
I know it. Um, although I will say our plant is subpar to today's standards. It's this 1960s plant that was updated in the 90s, and it needs it needs to be it needs to be a different process. It needs to be rebuilt. So all of these extra people will help pay for that, but the sewer rates are going to have to go up to help to pay for the loan on it. Um, and we can I can get more information on our SDCs um, from the engineer as well as Chris has told me 10 times at least what our water rights are and how much we're making right now. And I can't remember that off the top of my head right now. So we can get an update to you maybe in next meeting if we could add that on a little update on um, where we are with our water rights. We also have just reached out to try to figure out how to get more water rights in the next five to 10 years. So just jumping in the water rights, in, so the info about what we have access to is in, um, is in the uh, first proposal. It's on one of the reports in the first proposal, but it, I don't okay. think it says how much we're it's currently like, pulling out. It's like 16 it's million like, gallons a day or some. No, it's that could be, be totally our, imaginary. <laughs> what I yeah, just said. our rights are like 2.8. I think our right is 2.8 and we're pulling, <laughs> we're making a million gallons a day. But see, I'm just, I'm trying to remember that right now. So I'd have to get those. We can get those numbers out to you though. Um, and so we are you know, eventually, which is minuscule compared to what they pull out down the river from us. Um, but we are working, looking at that right now. The wastewater treatment plant, we're working on financing, working on a piece of property. The council wanted it to go outside the urban growth boundary to the north, which is likely where the city would go. Um, and so we're working on getting a, like a permanent easement on a piece of property out there, um, which is looking promising. How does it look to take a 36 inch or 48 inch main line out there across dozens of properties. Mm -hmm. It's actually not that many properties because there's, um, I think we can get all the way to Hypo with one property owner. And then the rest of the way, like out to Folsom, can't remember how many there are, but um, it, Kurt's not too concerned about that um, as far as being able to get those easements in place. So. And, and we're fully vetted, feeling like that's where we need to go. Yes. By who? By by our engineer. By, and the city, by the city council's recommendation, looking 40, 50 years ahead, where we're growing towards. Um, and then Kurt thought it was a really good idea. And I thought, good luck trying to get somebody out in the county to sell you property for a wastewater treatment plant. That's probably not going to happen. Um, but there's a willing property owner and um, there's also a lot of concerned people. So Kurt's company, Kern McLeod, our, our engineer is not large enough to manage this project. So he's gonna help us put an RFP out or Q, RFQ um, for, to get an engineering <coughs> company to come in for the design, engineering, public outreach. They'll help us with all of that. Um, and I'm more and more convinced that that's the right thing to do. It was it being here for 50 years. My first, it was I. I felt a lot of pushback on that. I'm like, that's not a, a great thing to do. But as I've thought about it more, we've talked about it more, worked on it. It seems like it's the the best thing, the best option. Yeah. Kurt might know, Taylor might be able to speak to this, but we are getting close to where Kurt's going to be very, very, well, we ha it has to be like within three years. Can we provide services within three years? And Kurt has said we can reduce that to can we provide services within two years, I think is what he mentioned one time. But he's getting very close to um, saying, no, we can't, we need to, we need to hold off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we are moving we are moving forward we're close on financing we're close on the property close on getting the engineer just takes it seems to take so long to move through those processes um and so i feel like we are moving forward um by the first of the year we should be in in better shape regarding those three pieces and then it's however long it takes them to design and engineer it i don't know how long that takes a year. I don't know if it takes a year. 
and then the construction probably a couple more years so three years out uh, and that's and that's positive sunny side thinking mm -hmm. I don't know if it's that. I don't know what size it is, but it's it's. A big I, I'm pack. just guessing, yeah. but if we're planning for 50 years and we're doing this once, we might as well. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we can. Yeah, so I think we need to have um, have Kurt. He could zoom in, give an update um, to you, and answer some questions on the wastewater treatment plant process. He could also. Well, we could email you like how much water rights do we have? How much are we making? Um, we have enough water rights. We just need, I think, another pump to get to be able to pump out enough water. In the wintertime, we're totally fine. Um, it's in the summertime when people are watering their yards and filling their little kiddie pools and the kid leaves the hose running all day long because, you know, it's that those hot days. That's when we start pushing into the upper limits of what we can make right now. We are putting in another a fifth reservoir which gives us extra storage and the redundancy for serving the higher level um, homes. And so we're, you know, we're, we're working on it and all these aspects, but you guys don't know that unless we tell you. And so we need to keep giving up. We need to get better at giving you updates. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. This might be the wrong place for the question, but um, a lot of the commissions require you to be in the city limits to be on the commission. Um, what about, can that be changed to where a commissioner could be in the urban growth boundary, but not in the city limits? Um, I think actually, so library board, it's the library district. This is in the school district. Some of you are in city and some of our school district. Three. I'm right. outside the city limits. A lot of the committees have a requirement mm -hmm. for a certain amount that are in like the, um, yeah, and, and and allowed to have a certain amount of people that are out. And they don't have to be out. They can all be in, but they, they have the opportunity to be out. So Parks and Rec, Arts Commission, you guys, um, Library Board. I think the, the DEC, you have to be in city limits or own a business in city limits. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we do try to, try to, you know, include the surrounding area and things like that that affects everybody. The members, I have the membership pulled up okay. for this commission. Uh, it needs at least four members that are residents of the city. And then any non-resident member needs to reside within the area of uh, the zip code. Um, but yeah, it would make, it would make sense from a planning, you know, Oregon land use program um perspective for those residents in the city at least to be within the urban growth boundary because that's the boundary within which the city has planning jurisdiction or planning authority you know mm -hmm. even if we haven't annexed those <laughs> lands yet we are intending for them to eventually be annexed we're planning for what they're going to be zoned like and how they're going to develop once they do come in so yeah um while i'm already talking um I wanted to just run this by you guys and see if this sounds like a good thing to do moving forward, um, especially for bigger applications or bigger like uh, amendment proposals. Um, we There's no reason we couldn't start sending out those applications two weeks ahead of your meeting. Like if you're finding that it's you, a week just isn't enough time to review all the materials, we could send the application, like the submitted applications or the draft amendments two weeks ahead. I cannot promise that the staff report would come out any earlier than one week. We usually push right up to that um, deadline, not because we're lazy, um, but because sometimes we don't receive all of the other agency comments until then or what, whatever. Maybe we are lazy. I don't know. Um, so we can, we can, <laughs> well, we can at least send out some of the materials earlier so that you have more time to review those. And then you get the full packet when we get out of the material, uh, meeting. Um, that also means that, um, you could start asking us questions about those applications or proposals as soon as you <coughs> receive them. So like Melanie said, there's no problem with us having conversations, answering questions ahead of the meeting. Um, so we can start doing that. If anyone feels like they don't 
want that to happen. Maybe you're sensitive to receiving more emails. Sometimes I feel like I wish I received fewer emails. Um, just let us know and we can exclude you. Otherwise, I think we'll just start doing that. Um, future meeting agendas, we could just include a discussion se section on all of our future agendas. Um, if there's not a bigger discussion necessarily to be had, we could either use that time to um, pose one of our one of the like visioning questions from our list and just gradually incrementally collect feedback on those, um, or have that part of the agenda be like the um, commission comments portion where and if you you know if you want to share something or discuss something that would be the time. And if it were a meeting that went really long and people wanted to go home, you could just say, there's nothing to discuss. <laughs> Let's go. Um, but we could at least leave that, leave that space on the agenda in case there is something people want to discuss. And if any of you want to uh, make a recommendation or request a guest or something, let Ben know as the chair and, he, and then he can request that as staff and we can see what we can do and get that on the agenda too. Mm -hmm. Um, and then last thing that I wanted to say is, um, upcoming meetings and events that we would love your partnership on. Um, so next Thursday, we have the, um, September 22nd meeting with the housing amendments and the marijuana amendments, um, the October, both October and November meetings, we need to shift them a week earlier. Um, hopefully there will be a quorum. So that would be October 20th and November 17th. I can send this out in an email for yes, everyone's please. record too. Um, and those are just regular planning commission meetings. Um, what I'm more excited about are um, some community events coming up that are for planning related topics. On October 25th, which is a Tuesday, we're holding the first community workshop, like open house for the transportation system plan. Um, and so that we're really hoping that our um, decision makers will attend and talk with folks and talk with staff. Um, so that is happening. I think it's starting at, I think it's, we're doing 5.30 to seven on Tuesday, October 25th. Then in November on Tuesday, November 15th is the next What's Up Estacada event, which is, um, I'll send out information about that, but we're doing a morning, like coffee, coffee with the city type of thing. We'll have, I think, light pastries maybe. Um, and I think we're starting at 7.30. I think we said 7.30 to 7.30 to 9. To so. try to catch the people that might be able to come in the morning that haven't been able to come in the evening. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there right. You go. yeah. So the What's Up Estacada, it's this quarterly series of informal events that we're doing just to allow members of the community to come in, talk with us, share their concerns, ideas, you know, get their questions answered. Um, and we have the agency, different agency partners join um, and different local like community organizations, nonprofits also partner on those events. Did you send me those dates? You're seeing the dates and I just sitting here like Yes. Oh. Yeah. I'm gonna send this all out in an email. Um, but yeah, just wanted to announce those. Thank you for staying late. Okay. Oh yes. Oh, I don't want to give that out. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, my extension is two one one. For information, and call two one one, right? <laughs> Phone number two one one. Oh, quit Megan Tracy. Yeah, I tried calling one time and I got one of these guys. You're like, who am I talking to? <laughs> Our phone numbers will be changing yeah. soon. We'll have to update. We'll yeah, have to give you the right phone number soon. Uh, I have I so keep going. <laughs> we have to get all new business cards. I, I but yeah, it'll be better though. But yeah, two two one one for mm -hmm. Taylor. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we're okay. ready to turn this. Yeah, let's get Thanks out of everybody. here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tara. Taylor, do I need to Thank you, out? guys. Thank yes. you. Thanks, Tara. <laughs> no, no, no.
you said you send the envelopes every month. Why so, are you sending questionnaire in one 